We have, uh, as promised this morning, an interesting speaker for you for the next part of our program. I'd like first to introduce the people who are up here at the head table, all of whom are, most of whom at least, are participants in the program today. Uh, if they haven't been this morning, they will be this afternoon. First, on my left, uh, I introduced him this morning, but I'd like him to take another bow, Ed Phillips of the Accounting Department at UCLA. An associate of his in the Accounting Department at UCLA, Dr. Ben Carson. You met Maurice Munitz, but Maurice, would you like to take another bow? Over here, starting at the far right from the Los Angeles uh, City College, I almost said state, Associate Professor of Accounting, Albert Abramson. And from the uh, University of California, oh, wait a minute. Somebody put this out. I knew he wasn't at UCLA. If he was, it was a change. From Claremont Men's College, and I guess a former member of the Board of Accountancy, George Gibbs. What was that? Well, I don't keep up with those things, George, being a tax specialist. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Uh, from, the, from San Diego State College and a current member of the Board of, of, of Accountancy, and I have that right, Chuck Lambden. <laughs> Associate Dean of the School of Business Administration at USC, uh, Dick Williamson. <laughs> and uh, John, would you like to take another bow? John Queenan, you met him this morning. raise this. I, Cliff's taller than I am, and I'm sure that I was trying, but I wasn't strong enough to. All right. Cliff's going to have to uh, get out on his knees. And one other distinguished guest that should be introduced, uh, and I'm sure many of you know him, and probably many of you are his former students. We have with us today the former Dean of the School of Business at UCLA, Mr. Howard Noble. Now his title is Professor Emeritus. We in the uh, uh, practicing accounting profession know our speaker Cliff Heimbucker quite well. He's a Californian. He uh, practices in San Francisco, and we're quite proud of the fact that we now have the president of the AICPA from our state. But I don't know how well you educators know him, and I thought you would like me to go into his background a bit. Cliff uh, was born in Chicago, attended the uh, high school there, and then Columbia University School of Business, where he graduated in 1932. In addition to being an accountant, Cliff has some interesting hobbies or avocations which uh, I think bear mention. For one thing, he is um, very active in the field of electronics and uh, is interested in the advancement of science through that interest. He also is an explorer. I guess that's the right word, Cliff. Uh, I don't know whether... whether uh, well, uh, according to the information I have, he led an expedition into the Navajo Canyon of Arizona in 1953, and this was the first time a group, group of white men had ever been there. So I think that would entitle him to the explorer category. Uh, I'd like to know, Cliff, how you could be sure that there hadn't been any white men there, white men there before you. <laughs> but this trip earned him election to executive membership in the Explorers Club of New York, whose roster consists of about 200 members. He's also active in the Sierra Club, uh, and, uh, which involves, of course, climbing mountains. He's now uh, climbing the highest mountain of his career, I think, though, as president of the Institute. I asked him a while ago if he felt like Lincoln taking office during a period when 
the house might be divided. But uh, Cliff tells me he feels more like Henry Clay, the great compromiser. <laughs> so uh, at this time, I would like to introduce to you Cliff Heimbrecher. <laughs> Yes, please. That, thank you, Bill. That's fine. Thank you. I'm delighted to be invited to visit you in this outlying region. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you will recognize that that, um, that that expression is not original with me. That's a quotation from your own president. Um, I'd also like to mention that the uh, title of my talk today, What the Public Accounting Profession Wants from the Colleges, is not of my own choosing. After all, a non-academician like myself would not be so presumptuous as to suggest that he's qualified to uh, tell a group of educators what and how they ought to teach. However, since I've been asked to do so, I'm not going to pass up such a golden opportunity. <laughs> Seriously, m much of what I intend to say really relates to uh, areas of uh, cooperation between the colleges and the practicing uh, profession in meeting the changing educational needs of the future. As I see it, there are four general areas in which the profession relies upon the colleges and the educators. They are, first, in the training of entrants into the profession, the graduates who uh, um, join our ranks. Secondly, in the area of research. Third, in the area of continuing education. And fourth, in attracting a fair share of the intelligent youth to our profession. And here I use the um, term our profession to include both the educators and the practicing members of the profession. Turning first to this matter of the training of entrants into the profession, the American Institute has gone on record with educational policies relating to academic training for a career in accounting. This is a fairly well-established matter, one that the Institute has paid great attention to, and uh, which is on the record. These policies stem originally from the 1956 report of the Commission on Standards of Education and Experience for CPAs. I had the honor and pleasure of serving on that commission, as did also Ira Frisbee. Um, this commission was an independent body composed of educators and practitioners under the chairmanship of the late Donald P. Perry. Its report and its conclusions attracted wide attention, and this led to the appointment of a special committee of the Institute under the chairmanship of George Bailey, to whose task it was to formulate specific proposals for adoption as Institute policy. In April 1959, the Council of the Institute approved a series of 13 resolutions which had been uh, promulgated and recommended by this special committee. For the purposes of our present discussion, the principal policies embodied in those resolutions, and I'm paraphrasing and, and summarizing only, are as follows. First, a baccalaureate degree based on a balanced program should be a requirement for a CPA certificate. Second, as soon as it is feasible, postgraduate education devoted principally to accountancy and business administration should become a requirement. Third, the, um, the American Institute of CPAs and its members individually should take part in assisting the colleges in planning courses, providing program materials, and in lecturing. And fourth, the American Institute should take the leadership in causing periodic reviews of education for CPAs. Now, implementation of these policies has been carried out principally by the Committee on Relations with Universities and by the Long Range Objectives Committee. Five lively and constructive seminars on the subject of the future of accounting education were conducted by the former in 1961 and 1962. And in the, those same years, the Long Range Objectives Committee obtained the endorsement of the Council of the Institute for two far-reaching objectives which I think it's uh, wor worthwhile to state because they lie at the root of the uh, kind of accounting education we're going to need in the future. The first objective says, it is an objective of the Institute to encourage CPAs to perform the entire range of services consistent with their professional competence, ethical standards, and responsibilities. In furtherance of this objective, the Council requests the Executive Committee 
to take steps to the following ends, to encourage educational institutions to broaden the curriculum for prospective CPAs to include subjects relating to management services developments affecting the accounting function. The second objective, which uh, Council adopted, states, it is an objective of the Institute, one, to encourage the description and continuous restating of those areas of knowledge and technical competence required by the CPA in his present and prospective professional practice, and two, to bring about the clarification of the areas of responsibility of universities, practitioners, and professional societies in the education and training of CPAs. The most recent and far-sighted of these recurring expressions of the need for continual review is the current project of the Institute to define the common body of knowledge of CPAs. This project is being financed equally by the Institute and the Carnegie Corporation of New York. The interest of the Carnegie Corporation is itself evidence of the growing awareness of the importance of accounting education to society as a whole. The two main objectives of this study are, first, it will determine the knowledge which the CPA must have at the outset in order to provide the public with service of the minimum scope and quality which the public needs and has a right to expect from him at the start of his career. And second, and this is even more important, it will define the knowledge and intellectual habits which the beginning CPA must have to be able to keep pace with the growth of general knowledge of the profession in the next generation and to work into one of the present or future specialties of the profession. Dean Robert Roy of the School of Engineering Science of John Hopkins University is the study director. He will participate in our California Society annual meeting in June, and we hope he'll have some very constructive uh, things to tell us at that time. Now, um, so much for the um, uh, stated policies of the Institute in this area of uh, accounting education. Uh, what inferences can we draw from these policies? Well, we could, can draw quite a few as to what kind of graduate we want from the colleges. In general, these are, first, that a four-year curriculum is expected to produce a man with a substantial background in arts and sciences, business and economics, and accounting. And second, that if additional time is available to students, the background in arts and sciences rather than in technical subjects should be expanded. But the most significant feature of the Institute's policy is the repeated emphasis on re-evaluation, which is exemplified by the study of the common body of knowledge. This emphasis indicates that we are not satisfied with the current policies for the long pull. That study grew out of a recognition that quantitative standards are not enough, that we should be thinking in qualitative and subject matter terms as well. The American Accounting Association in its Education Committee's activities is following this same trend. For example, the report of the 1963 Committee on Educational Standards, of which Carl Moyer was chairman, uh, has a few things to say about this. I'd like to quote a few statements which, uh, uh, to me, coincide quite closely with the American Institute's uh, policies. The subject matter of accounting encompasses a body of knowledge that lies behind the information system underlying all economic activity. Well, reading that, I wonder who is way out. Is it the practicing profession or is it the uh, <laughs> professors? Although accounting involves a basic discipline backed by a considerable body of theory, it is generally agreed that one who prepares for a career in accounting must have a background considerably broader than merely a thorough understanding of accounting concepts and procedures. The objective of general education is no different for the accountant than for other college students. The curriculum should be based on a broad foundation in general subjects. The students should come to understand the major concepts of mathematics, physical and biological sciences, and the social sciences. The complex of organizations that make up the commercial and industrial community is varied, and managing such organizations becomes more technical and more complicated year by year. If the accountant is to serve the community well, he must be equipped with an understanding of human relations and of the functioning of the major divisions of business adequate to permit an efficient blending of accounting with production, distribution, and finance. 
The internal accountant is a member of the business managerial team. A constantly increasing portion of the accountant's work deals with the future rather than the past. And lastly, it is important to emphasize qualitative rather than quantitative factors of education. If you professors are really this far out, then I think we ought to, ought to get going. What are we waiting for? Now, the um, American Accounting Association 1962 Committee on Courses and Curricula, of which Paul Fertig was uh, chairman, listed four basic objectives which should be achieved by university accounting curriculum. Abbreviated, these objectives are, one, to develop the accounting student's ability to work effectively, to think analytically and objectively, to become mentally disciplined, and to communicate orally and in writing. Second, to make the accounting student fully aware of his responsibility for self-education and self-development for the remainder of his career. Third, to develop an appreciation of the accountant's, the accountant's high standard of integrity, independence, and objectivity in reporting. And fourth, to attract to accounting careers those students who seem to possess the potential for making a contribution to the advancement of accounting and who have the aptitudes which indicate reasonable success in it. And now, the AAA 1963-64 Committee on Auditing Instructions, of which Gene Brown of Stanford is chairman, has recently added a fifth objective, which I consider very essential to, this, to the earlier four, namely, to provide the accounting student with sufficient understanding of his discipline as the necessary foundation for a career. <clears throat> now, it would be futile, of course, uh, to attempt to establish standards for accounting education in qualitative terms without having in mind a picture of the accounting practice of the future and what kinds of work the practitioner will be performing. In order to tell you what we want, we must try to envision the world of the future and our place in it. The future, of course, may not be ours to see, <clears throat> but we must make an attempt to do so. And you professors may have as good an insight as we as to what kind of world and accounting practice we shall have a generation hence. However, there are some general trends which we can discern affecting our social and economic environment and some developing needs for our services that we can hope to prepare ourselves for. For example, it seems likely that a greater degree of governmental overall economic planning is inevitable. The need to stimulate demand to support an ever-increasing gross national product supply may make such planning imperative. This trend may be further accelerated by the competitive struggle with other economic systems of the world, the European common market, for example, the Soviet system, and even the uh, red Chinese economic system, where we are in competition with all of them. The government's role in regulation and an intervention in price and wage matters is also likely to grow. There is almost daily evidence of this. The rapid growth of automated devices has already brought about major changes in business information systems. The upgrading of jobs required by automation and the creation of new highly sophisticated jobs growing out of increased expenditures for research leads to a demand for better educated people. Now what effect are these trends likely to have on business management? The answer again seems to involve more planning with less emphasis on historical analysis and more on the prospective management process. Such planning will be necessary in order to operate efficiently and economically in the face of increased government regulation and greater international competition. Such planning will also be necessary in order to enable management to put to effective use the longer-run programming and other advantages <coughs> made possible by automation. Increased social responsibility and higher ethical standards may lead to the development of means for formal accountability of management for non-economic objectives, accountability for its use of resources and manpower and for its uh, um, attitudes toward uh, worker welfare. Things of that kind may become the means uh, for more formal accountability. Now, how do these trends relate to the kind of men we shall seek as entrance to the profession? It is clear that we shall have to take a broader view of our role in society, both as a profession and as individuals. Two significant aspects emerge from this look into the future. 
The first is that we are likely to become more and more involved in the measurement and communication of all data of an economic or quantitative nature, rather than the financial data alone. The second is that we shall inevitably have to apply the accounting function more and more to prospective planning operations for the benefit of both government and private industry. Part of this expansion of the scope of our practice will come about through an extension of our traditional attest function, or independent audit function, into areas arising out of growing needs in the economic and social environments. I'm thinking of such things, for example, as attesting to federal and state governments on matters involving cost data, grants, loans, or subsidies, or on wage rates, or on the administration of regulated companies. Even more important, in view of the expected growth in long-range planning, is the need for attestation of the data employed in developing business and government plans for the future. CPAs are already performing so-called management audits, that is, evaluating and attesting to various managerial actions and results. In this role, the CPA is reporting upon the effectiveness with which a business entity has carried out its objectives. It has been suggested that this role may be extended to other organizational entities, governmental units, social organizations, countries, or even international alliances. Obviously, such an expanded role will require extensive educational effort and greatly increased skills. I suggest that many of the required courses for such an education have not yet been developed, and in most cases not even thought of. In addition to these extensions of the attest function, we are likely also to see a significant expansion of the area of service which we call management services. These services involve the many non-auditing and non-tax areas which are a vital concern to business units, accounting systems, budgets, costs, mergers, production control, organization planning, product pricing, to name only a few of them. Here again, we are struck by the constantly increasing emphasis on future planning, on prospective accounting, and on putting to effective work the massive information made available by the new information developing systems. Many of the skills that we have developed, particularly in the areas of auditing and analyzing, are being rapidly replaced by scientific reporting systems. Clearly, we must master and absorb these new techniques into the accounting function itself. The area of professional service to which the accounting profession should move is that of the total information and control system of organizations. The teaching of the multitudinous skills involved in preparing to perform a wide range of management services poses a real challenge for the profession and for the colleges. It is my hope that the Common Body of Knowledge Project may produce some guidelines in this area to help us differentiate the knowledge which every CPA must have from that which may be left to the specialist. Now, coming back to the present for a moment, it is important to note that the public accounting profession is a very diverse one. There are wide variations in the number of CPAs in a firm and also in the range of skills which that may imply. A few recent statistics may be helpful. An analysis of the firm status of all members of the American Institute of CPAs engaged in public accounting last May showed that the 31,685 members comprised 12,359 firms, and these 12,359 firms had 20,700 individual practitioners and partners and about 11,000 staff men, in other words, about two-thirds of them of the total number of members engaged in public accounting were either sole mm -hmm. practitioners or partners, and only one-third were staff men, which was a rather surprising breakdown to me. Now, obviously, this results from the fact that individual practitioners represented 95% of the total number of firms. So uh, if, we leave, if we omit those from the figures and um, just add up the other small firms, by which I'm I selected those having from two to five members of the institute in the firm. These amounted to 29% of the total and included 7,800 partners and 1,983 staff men. So even in these firms, there was an average of only about one quarter of a staff man per partner. On the other hand, the remaining 5% of the firms, those having from six 
members to over 100, accounted for 4,700 partners and 8,900 staff men, or an average still of a little less than two staff men per partner. Only if we uh, confine ourselves to the 12 largest firms in the country do we have uh, figures that change this result somewhat. The 12 largest firms alone had 1,641 partners and 6,618 staff men, or an average of over four staff men per partner. Now, what does this mean? That this merely gives us some information on the wide diversity in size of firms and staffs. But I think it implies also a wide diversity in sizes of engagements and also in the opportunity for the application of specialized knowledge or the lack of it. Personally, I think that this wide diversity is in many ways a source of great strength and vitality for our profession. I realize full well, however, that it presents great difficulty for you college professors in furnishing adequately educated entrants to the profession. How can I tell you what the public accounting profession wants from the colleges when the profession doesn't all want the same thing? I know that some of the members of the Institute request you to train graduates in the use of adding machines, and many of them seriously expect you to produce a man who is immediately productive upon graduation. There are other members who want you to provide liberally educated graduates with basic knowledge of economics, both macro and micro, the business environment, including international business, mathematics and operations research, human relationships, particularly in business organizations, and accounting theory. This latter group of members typically has the resources to carry new members through a more or less unproductive period and to develop their knowledge and abilities. This diversity of desires, however, need not be distracting to educators, at least at the present state of our development. The task of each institution is to select its own educational goals and pursue them to the best of its abilities in both activities, taking into account its resources of faculty skills, library and physical plant facilities, and quality of student body. In my view, both your goal and the desire of the profession should be an education that will foster intellectual growth in your graduates over the course of a lifetime. Now I should like to move on briefly to the subject of research. I had mentioned that this was one of the areas in which I thought we could cooperate. College professors have made and are making outstanding contributions to knowledge and to advancement of the state of the art through research and accounting. This research has been carried out in various ways through their own individual inspiration and efforts by one. Second, by participation in university-sponsored activities. Third, by the American Institute through the use of professors, both members of the Institute and non-members in its own research program and in a, through the Accounting Principles Board. Four, through the activities of their graduate students. And five, through special commissions or study groups sponsored by the profession and public-minded foundations or other institutions. The Common Body of Knowledge Project is an example of that. We earnestly solicit your continuing interest in research, and we hope that it will cover the whole spectrum of knowledge that may be useful in our future society. It should certainly cover technical accounting matters. This we can take for granted. But personally, and, and more importantly, I should like to see it also cover broader, more basic fields of knowledge, that only recently have begun to receive the attention that they deserve. I refer to such subjects as the na nature of human communication, for example. Do our audit reports really communicate to, our, to the users of them what we think they communicate? Personally, I don't believe we really know. I don't think anyone has really explored this question. The place of information systems in organizations, the control of organizations through quantitative methods, and mathematical applications to economic and business problems. Even more basic than this is the need for fundamental research on the extremely elaborate and still very inadequately described interlockings of the whole range of modern organizations themselves. The United States particularly has spawned a, a, a tremendous variety of organizations of all types which uh, interlock very closely. No one has ever classified these or even attempted to describe them in, in fundamental basic terms. If we can learn how to measure an organization as such and its functioning in terms of its products, its input, its communications, 
and describe it in fundamental terms, then we can easily adjust to changing techniques as they are developed. In fact, we will develop them instead of having them thrust upon us. Most professions are faced with the problem of bridging the gap between the basic disciplines, that is, the, the sciences or the arts, and the practicing profession itself. This takes communication, and it takes a profession that cares enough about the fundamental knowledge to encourage that kind of communication. In this field of organization communication, there are always inventors and innovators, and they may occur on either side of this gap, on the research and educational side, or on the practicing side. We must develop and maintain an adequate communication bridge between them. I think that our profession, and I include both the accounting educators and the accounting practitioners in the term, can be well pleased with the progress we have made in this direction. But we can do more, because this bridge is, is constantly in danger of breaking down. There's a natural tendency for uh, an individual to be on, on one side or the other in his thinking and in his uh, uh, actual daily work. So much for research. Earlier, I stressed the importance of placing primary emphasis in professional accounting on training a man to learn to become a practicing professional man rather than to be one at the completion of the formal educational process. This brings us to the problem of continuing education. First, I'd like to mention a matter that has concerned me somewhat. Colleges and universities have many executive development courses or executive management courses, but I don't know of a single one that has been planned for the CPA. The Institute, of course, has a professional development program that is a very successful going concern. Many of you have helped us to prepare to give the courses, but I wonder if there isn't something more fundamental that you can do for the practicing accounting profession. Perhaps all that I'm asking is that you advertise your present executive development courses among CPAs and perhaps do something to identify them with this type of program, both in their own eyes and those of recruits to the program from management. On the other hand, perhaps you have a better alternative to propose. If so, we'd certainly like to hear about it. The present trend of curricula, particularly four-year curricula, is to emphasize the arts and sciences and to reduce the amount of time and the coverage of accounting subjects. We agree with this. To whatever extent this trend represents a correction of overemphasis on technique and application, the profession is for it. To whatever extent it means that college graduates have not been exposed to accounting knowledge that is required for of a practicing CPA at the outset of his career, I personally am still for it, because I am sure that you have given him something more important than accounting. <coughs> but he must still learn the omitted accounting knowledge sometime. It can be learned through individual study. The Institute is considering filling this gap and is on record as having stated that it intends to do so. The official educational policy of the American Institute says that postgraduate study devoted principally to accountancy and business administration should be a requirement for the CPA certificate. The policy goes on to state, when postgraduate education is undertaken and the curriculum of postgraduate study is devoted principally to accountancy and business administration, such courses taken beyond the baccalaureate degree are deemed to compensate for deficiencies in accounting and business courses in undergraduate study, provided the total curriculum in accountancy and business administration shall be substantially the equivalent of that included in the four-year undergraduate program recommended by the Standard Ratings Committee of the American Accounting Association. As a corollary, it is expressly confirmed that graduates receiving baccalaureate degrees in liberal arts, engineering, and the like shall be encouraged to enter public accounting with postgraduate study devoted principally to accounting and business administration. We welcome your advice, counsel, and assistance to implement this policy statement. We believe the time to do so has arrived. This brings us naturally to my last topic, namely that of how to attract a fair share of the intelligent youth to our profession. We are coming of age and rapidly approaching the point of recognition as a true learned profession. In order to fulfill this promise and adequately to meet the needs of society which lie within our potential competence, we must recruit students who can benefit from the broad scope of education that we propose, who can develop into educational leaders, and who can meet constructively the challenges that lie ahead. The American Institute, 
the Financial Executives Institute, the National Association of Accountants, and the Institute of Internal Auditors have joined with the American Accounting Association to create the Accounting Careers Council to attract qualified students to accounting careers. Here, our wants and goals coincide completely with yours and with those of the other organizations named. The objective here is to attract intelligent um, students to the accounting profession, embracing everyone concerned with the accounting function, regardless of whether they're going to become teachers or financial vice presidents or CPAs. We encourage our members and members of state societies to work in the local units of the Accounting Careers Council, most of which are spearheaded by um, American Accounting Association members. We solicit your continuing efforts in its recruiting activities. Our experience, on which our participation in the ACC program is based, has been that public accounting can attract accounting majors. The central problem is to get them into your programs. However, personally, I don't believe this is enough. It seems to me that the ACC effort is directed primarily at the high school level. Consequently, it seems to me that it may tend to attract principally those students who plan to study for four years only and then to enter the profession fully trained. This means that for the most part, they do not have sufficient time for the broad scope of education that I feel is necessary. Often students entering college choose a broad general program with a major in arts, science, or engineering with, de with the deliberate intention of deferring a decision on a specific career until later. These are the people that we should like to reach as they near the end of their undergraduate work and prepare to decide upon a graduate course of study. Those of you who offer graduate programs likely to attract such people will find our practicing CPAs to be willing allies in your efforts to recruit them. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff. I think your talk was certainly well directed to this audience, and I would expect we would get some questions. Do we have any from, particularly from the educators? You don't think you answered all their questions, do you? Yes, I did. Well, should we get on to a discussion of how you knew there weren't any white men in the, <laughs> by the color of the native skin? Or how was it? <laughs> the way I knew that to answer your question is that when we um, arrived in the uh, bottom of this um, uh, Navajo Canyon, which we had selected for exploration from the air, we discovered uh, two Navajo families who had been uh, uh, living there for several generations, they uh, assured us, and uh, no white men had ever been there. We also found two uh, uh, cliff dwellings down there of quite substantial size, which we reported to the Smithsonian Institution, and they had never been previously reported. You answered my question. <laughs> that shows what happens when you ask an expert. Are there any questions? Here's one. I'd like to raise one question or offer one comment. Uh, many people, of course, uh, do advocate the or perhaps having accounting people go into a liberal arts program for the first four years and then into a graduate program if you have suggested. And I wonder uh, if we're not falling into a trap in our thinking in this respect. There seems to be an implication that accounting is less stimulating, that intellectually stimulating, less challenging, uh, less informative than many of the courses offered in arts and sciences. Uh, I'd like to suggest that uh, perhaps uh, accounting courses are equally stimulating, <coughs> uh, intellectually challenging, and uh, productive in terms of having well-educated, disciplined people. I, I think that this is very true, and perhaps I didn't make my uh, comments clear. I think I, I did mention earlier in my remarks that because of the diversity of the um, accounting firms, um, there is a need for many different types of entrance into the profession. And um, it is, um, I, I think we should have, have both types. My particular plea is not that we should um, uh, prevent people from studying accounting at, at the undergraduate level. I, th I think we need those people and uh, the people who want to do that, but I'm trying to get more uh, of those who don't start out that way 
and, and uh, attract some of the intelligent ones who start out without knowing where they're going or plan to go into another field. And I think that we don't always uh, uh, have an avenue of communication to those people because many other professions uh, have established um, communications with them, and I think we can do a lot to uh, uh, increase the uh, number of the intelligent youth that way. Yes, what, what I, I'm really advocating, uh, expressed another way, is that if a, a student is only going to have four years, if this is, is all he can afford, then certainly he should get the accounting. If he can afford five or six years, then personally I would prefer to uh, see the accounting come along later in his uh, formal education period rather than at the beginning. I, I think this is right. I, I agree with you completely. I think we ought to try to do more of that. There's a question down here. So. Uh, I don't know that it is possible to uh, uh, reconcile that, and I know that there are quite a, there's quite a substantial number of members of the um, practicing profession who believe that we should have our own uh, school, like the law and, and medicine and some others, and then there's another view, and that is that we should uh, continue to uh, uh, remain in the graduate schools of business because we have uh, an opportunity for a, a broader range of subjects. I don't really know what the a answer is, although I suspect that uh, both answers may be correct, that uh, as we grow and develop, possibly we can have both, that there is room for a professional uh, sc a school of professional accountancy, as well as recruiting or developing uh, practicing CPAs within the uh, uh, graduate schools of business, as we're doing now. Well, that, that's a very, very good question. I haven't given much thought to that one myself. Um, we, um, we have had some uh, discussion of that in this um, small group that I, I mentioned. Uh, uh, we, have, uh, we meet uh, at least uh, once a year with uh, uh, leaders of the internal auditors uh, and the financial executives and the NAA um, and the 3A, and we do just discuss this to some extent there. But uh, we have not implemented it. And I think this is an area to which we might very well give some attention. I think there's a concern among some of us that uh, a few students in high school take a little bookkeeping and develop some interest. And uh, then in the uh, usual four-year collegiate institution, they are expected to have one year of accounting only prior to upper division, and uh, there's a gap in there in
in which these kids are, are really trying to get their feet on the ground and decide where they're going to go. And they really haven't had any opportunity to feel <coughs> what accounting is like. I think maybe there should be some thought about bringing a little more of accounting to a lower level rather than pushing everything up into the graduate school. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I think that there, there may be something to that too, although I have one little um, concern with that, uh, and I may be wrong, but I've, I've had a feeling that if uh, that sometimes as far as the general public is concerned and as far as high school students are concerned, uh, they're not mature enough and do not have a wide enough uh, grasp of what the accounting profession really is like. And they tend to uh, equate it with bookkeeping or with the, uh, just the uh, uh, detailed um, techniques rather than with the broad concepts of the profession. That's the only danger that I see uh, uh, to that, that uh, a lot of the more intelligent um, uh, pupils might, on taking a bookkeeping course, for example, uh, decide that that career is not for them because it is not sufficiently challenging. And it takes a more mature uh, uh, college student to re really grasp the uh, true uh, breadth and scope of the profession. Very well said. Well, thank you. Well, thank you again, Cliff. 